Am I there yet? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hello? Yes. Good. Hi, Phil. Hi, Lauren. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Fine, thank you. It's wonderful to hear your voice again. It really is. Same here. One of your voices. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> You've got my number. I sure do, babe. Welcome to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show with your hosts, Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet. Phil and Ted's guest today is actress, comedian, and original Saturday Night Live cast member, Lorraine Newman. And now, your sexy boomer hosts, Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet. Welcome to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. I'm Ted Bonnet. And I'm Phil Proctor. And who are, who are we talking to today, Ted? Let me check. Oh, Lorraine Newman. Oh, yes. Uh, Saturday Night live. Late. Oh, live. Not live. Right, I've I've heard of the show. Yes, the legendary original cast member. Well, you know, the interesting thing is that Lorraine has come out with a book, which is called May You Live in Interesting Times. We should, probably should let her speak, right? Why not? I guess I'm diving in now and acknowledging my, my presence <laughs> there. Okay? Sure. Welcome. It's really nice to have you. Thank you. I read your book and enjoyed every bit of it because... Watching the first seasons of Saturday Night Live was really event television. Oh, my gosh, yes. It was so revolutionary. You were so lucky to be there. Absolutely. And your book has a nice pathway as to how that all happened. Because you said in your book, for me, SNL, which is the abbreviation for Saturday Night Live, SNL has been the gift that keeps on giving in wonderful ways and sometimes not so wonderful ways. And that can still occasionally send me to a dark place, which is interesting. We'll get there because... You were just a 22-year-old kid when you were swept into this phenomena. 23. You were 23. Got to say, it's 23. Oh, okay. That makes a big difference, Ted. <laughs> yeah, that extra year. Please, I know I know it well. Happened to me, too. When, you know, Firesign Theater, <laughs> I was very young with that. Firesign Theater was kind of like our own Saturday Night Live. You know, because it was a, a four-man Im, Im, basically writing and improvising and skit-making group. But the thing that's so interesting about your career is that you were really thrown into the lion's den. I mean, I'm sure that none of you, when when uh, this when the show started, had any idea that it would become such an amazing success and last for such a long time. For you, you about five years, right? Yeah, the first five years. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, I would hear Firesign Theater on the radio and um, Credibility Gap. Those yep. were like, you know, the first alternative, I would say, alt comedy groups that were doing the kind of material that you would, you've never heard before. And it was so innovative and so exciting to be a part, to listen to that. Yeah, we were altered. <laughs> when Saturday Night Live started, it was such an experiment. Did you even have time to think about whether or not this thing was going to work or how it was going to work? Well, you know, I don't. that's a big picture thing, and I can only speak for myself. I, I've never been one <laughs> for the big picture. And um, all I knew was that we were put together, all these disparate comedy voices, that, you know, the more we got to know one another's style— and sensibility, it was like fantastic, hilarious, and the kind that we've never heard or seen before. And it was um, an amalgam of all these things. And really, we didn't even know if we were anybody was seeing us. We were in a graveyard shift in terms of time slot. That's right. So um, we were really doing the show for ourselves and couldn't believe the kind of stuff we were getting away with. <laughs> 1975 was the first year, right? Yes. Think about what was going on in America in 1975. We were just getting over Vietnam War. We were just getting over Nixon's resignation. We were still in a hangover from the 1960s. Mm -hmm. 75 was sort of this sleepy period of time before things sort of revived again. The punk scene was starting to emerge, you know, the next wave of whatever right. it was going to be. And you were sort of in that middle. So you were really a one-up at the time. There was nothing like it. Yeah. Um, there was nothing like, as you said, all the things that were emerging at that time. And so, again, that's why the title of my book, it fit what I wanted to talk about in the book in terms of every kind of cultural movement and change and evolution and innovation. It seems like I 
I just happen to be there like Zelig, you know? <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah, what a, what a good uh, uh, reference. The amount of people you have met, known, worked with, hung out with. Yeah, it's because I did so many different things. You had a long association with the Groundlings here in L.A., right? And which is, uh, you know, still a very renowned improvisational group. And so many people came out of, of work there, including our beloved Phil Hartman. And yet that didn't seem to give you any confidence when it came to, like, you know, auditioning for things. Well, because that wasn't happening while I was on the show. Ah. But at the time, you know, nobody had heard of the Groundlings when I was at SNL. and Really? Belushi and Aykroyd would tease me all the time. And Chevy was like, what's the name of that group you're from? The Groundhogs? <laughs> Fuck you guys. Fuck you. <laughs> but I am so glad that it's become the farm team for all through the years for you know the show and movies like Bridesmaids and the one that's just come out. Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. Yeah, these are both Groundlings movies. Wow. Most of the actors in it are all Groundlings which is so nice because yeah. everybody's supporting one another. That's right. You know, it's the same with um, Michaela Watkins um, Casual. Hmm. A lot of Groundlings on that too. Just so good. So Audible is a spoken book company. Yes. It's Amazon's audiobook division. Okay, there you go. So they approached you with the idea of doing an audiobook, right? Right. At this point, it is not available in print. But it's very entertaining to, to hear you because you, you utilize your voice talents to great effect. Thank you. And your recall is amazing. Here's the thing. You know, I have, I had a terrible drug history. I, I started, I was an addict since I was 13. Really? That early? The one thing is that I never drank alcohol. Huh. Never. To this day, I, I just, I, I don't like the taste of alcohol. I don't like the way it feels. It never did anything for me mentally. It just, it's, yeah. it just made me uncoordinated. And I think I was drunk once in my life when I was 19, and that was it. Hmm. And so, uh, for better or worse, I remember a lot of shit. Yeah. I wish I didn't. Wish you didn't. <laughs> when you say that you became a drug addict at 13, it was because when you start having periods as a, as a teenager, the pain was so intense that you were prescribed Darvon. Yeah. Yeah, which is off the market now. <laughs> yeah, and that was like so many people, the beginning of a very bad slide. Yeah, but I would have sought out drugs no matter what. I really absolutely would have. God, I mean, it was the times, mid-70s, everybody was using drugs, pot, cocaine. True. SNL, as you write in the book, it was fairly drug-infused. Yeah, I mean, not everybody w were drug users. Uh, Gilda was not a drug user. Jane, I think, smoked pot, but that was about it, and probably rarely. So, you know, of the women, and, and I think, you know, Al Franken did not really use much. I mean, he smoked weed, but that was it. You know, um, it was people like me and Belushi uh, that really had problems, and Garrett. Did you work stone? Did you perform stone? Never. No. Same with me. Never. Same with me, because I, I had a cocaine habit for a while, and, uh, uh, and a lot of it had to do with the fact that we were working at night. All We had a special contract for Firesong Theater that gave us free studio time, but it was like, you know, from 11 o'clock until the wee hours, and so cocaine became a natural companion for work, you know, to keep us, keep me going, but when it came to that was like in the mixing and stuff like that. When it came to performing, nope, you couldn't couldn't use any drugs. No. Throw your timing off. You ruin your timing. Yeah. I remember uh, somewhat recently, I do this show called Celebrity Autobiography, where people read from celebrities' autobiographies. And I was really tired before a show one night, so I had coffee. And I remember it absolutely ruined my timing. Hmm. Coffee? <laughs> Just, I was so bummed. Yeah. It is an obstacle, especially in your situation with national television show. God knows how many millions of people watching. Well, I mean, real addicts, you know, they they don't care. Uh, they they don't care. It's uh, anywhere but here. So, you know, I just happen to have that sense of survival, I guess, where I knew myself. I mean, I also knew that I had no doubt that I was a drug addict. I, I was never in denial about it. I always knew that I was never one of those people that said, oh, I could quit any time. I knew I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And you write about 
when you first took that Darvon and knew how to, someone told you about taking the small pink pill that was inside of it, which was pure codeine. Yeah, little pills. Right. There's little pills inside the capsules. Yeah. yeah. You wrote, with no hesitation and no fear, I tried it immediately. I felt great. My entire body felt warm from the inside. I was present, but encased in a protection that made everything I encountered manageable. Warmed that arctic wind of crushing loneliness. This was my medicine. It's quite an endorsement, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and for nine ninety nine, you can get... I hope we just haven't sold a whole bunch of listeners down well, the river. It's too bad but... they took it off the market. Yeah, That's boy, all yeah. I can say. Yeah, well, also, God knows it. Uh, it's like MasterCard. you got to pay the bill at some point. So It seems like it, it was filling some sort of a void you had. Yeah, I loved drugs. Don't get me wrong. I really loved drugs. Um, so... You know, but they do work less as time goes on. I, I yeah. don't know if I was unique in that way, but for some reason I must have had such a toxic level that it took less for me to get high. And um, I, where I lived, I had a dealer that delivered and took checks. Lucky me! <laughs> uh, very nice guy, too. Um, in fact, it was another dealer that told me to uh, recommended a therapist that would help me get off drugs. Well, isn't that nice? Wow. Did, did, yeah, <laughs> and, and it worked, too. Wow. I, I think I write about that therapist, too. She was really an interesting individual. Wasn't sure she was born female. and uh, oh. So that's a very altruistic uh, uh, dealer. He actually, yeah. right, he was, he was going to lose a client, so he must have really yes. cared for you. And that's, that's kind of a sweet story. Yeah. Now we we worked together quite a, quite a bit uh, doing Disney oh, yeah. and Pixar movies, which was mm -hmm. so much fun, wasn't it? Oh God, oh, yes. Oh my goodness. And you know our dialogue, you know, for for these crowd scenes, you know, you know they're going to be mixed yeah. down, but you've got a lot of really funny people. Yeah that are doing such funny lines. <laughs> so it made these sessions so great. It's true. When I first walked in to do the Smurfs, it was a session where, unlike many sessions that we've done, that we do, Lorraine, where we're isolated, you know, and or maybe working with one other actor, uh, I walked into this room and every actor was sitting in the room. It's so fun to do it like that. Like doing a radio show. And there was Jonathan Winters. God. And Bob Ridgely and all these Man. extraordinary people. Well, if you saw Boogie Nights, Bob Ridgely was the uh, older gentleman who got caught for kitty porn. Yeah, it was typecasting. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah wow. <laughs> Easy, buddy. <laughs> oh, listen, Ridgely was so outrageous. Wasn't he, Lorraine? Yeah. If there was a break in the session, he would do one of the funniest, foulest improvisations. You know, he did John Wayne buggering Cookie. You know, oh, yeah, you, you, you old bugger, you bend over there. Oh, you, you hurt me. You hurt me, Duke. Oh, don't put some actual <laughs> grease on it. it <laughs> I still have that recorded. Oh, Lord. We're very, very lucky. How lucky we are. There's one thing to be doing the stress of having to perform on stage uh, in front of cameras and all that and, and getting it right, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to the the much more casual and, and free and fun experience of doing voices. Yeah, well, you're using uh, one instrument specifically, even though you're using you know, your emotional and, and uh, technical interpretation, you're not having to hit a mark. You're not having to find your light. You're not having to uh, remember the lines or orchestrate, right. you know, remember how you wanted to do the scene. You don't have to do that. And you can do it differently each time if you want. And it's just, it's a different craft, and I absolutely love it. And if we're talking about wonderful people to work with, I've got to say Fred Willard. Yeah, and as I say in my book, uh, I was really surprised to learn because, you know, this character he does, which is like the clueless boor. Yeah, yes, um, right. You always assume that, well, you never think that there's a craft to a character like that. But then I found out that he was from Second City, and I realized, well, God damn it, yes, there is a craft, and there is intention with all of that stuff. And it's just, it's a finesse that, I just am dazzled by. That's when I first turned on to him was uh, at the same time you were doing the early years of Saturday Night Live was 
in Fernwood tonight with Martin Mull. And yes, Jerry Hubbard. Yeah, Jerry Hubbard and Martin Mull. That was a unique time for television. Yeah. They were amazingly inspirational, you know? I mean, for, for a group like Firesign Theater, which was, you know, a very insulated kind of underground comedy group, basically, you know, our audience were, were uh, record fans of ours. We made records, and people would take them home and play them, you know, uh, under their beds at night, <laughs> right? right? Or, or, or stoned out of their minds in a college dorm room. <laughs> and it was uncensored. It was private, but uncensored. And Saturday Night Live, as you have been hinting at, was brand new cultural comedy, making fun of things overtly and getting away with it. Yeah. As you wrote in your book, there was a conscious effort at Saturday Night Live. You didn't want to be laughing. You wanted to take it to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we couldn't be laughing because it wasn't the perspective of the performers and the writers. Mm -hmm. It was a whole new thing, as was Fernwood Tonight and Firesign Theater. I mean, it's always you can't have one without the other. You know, you couldn't have SNL if you didn't have show of shows. And mm -hmm. as it goes, I mean, vaudeville is the is the template because it is really kind of sketch work. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you guys read Cliff Nestroff's wonderful book about stand-up, but he really does delineate, you know, the, the line, the through line of stand-up. In fact, he talks about how it got the name stand-up. People did not go up on stage and do stand-up. They would be in a room, like in a, a big, you know, uh, performance room, and they'd be at a table and they would stand up. Oh, my goodness. Which I thought was so fascinating, you know. And then, of course, they made their way to the stage eventually. But it was like, you know, the wow. coming out of the primordial slime and making your way up to the, up to the stage. But wow. as I write in my book, I was such a fan of comedy and such a kind of archival nerd about it. You know, I wanted to see everything, and I did get to see everything. Ah. The Comedy Store, when it first opened, I saw people trying out material. I saw Freddie Prinze and Richard Pryor and Jay Leno all trying out material. Were you doing Saturday Night Live at that time? No, I was. The Comedy Store had just opened, and I was underage. I couldn't go in. I had to stand by the door and watch everything. They were kind enough to let me do that. Wow. You grew up in Los Angeles, and you, you really had a... Uh, a wild upbringing. I mean, you you saw the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah, pretty middle class upbringing. But the pursuit of my interests took me to some pretty wild experiences. I would say. Well, this is why your book is called "May You Live in Interesting Times." Yes. One of the things that really struck me was the brief encounter with Johnny Winter. I was a big fan of Johnny Winter, and yeah. I didn't see this one coming. Yeah, he was your, your knight in white, our amour. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I didn't realize that, you know, my pursuit of, I was such a fan of his music, and I just wanted to meet him. I was a huge blues fan. When I would go to the Ash Grove, I would see, I don't know if you know that movie, Cadillac Records, with Adrian Brody. Oh, yes. But all the acts in that movie, with the exception of, I think, Little Walter, I have seen all all of those people. Wow. I was friends with Etta James for a while. You know, I uh, saw everybody, Willie Dixon, Chicago All-Stars, T-Bone Walker, Sonny Terry and Brandy McGee, Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters. Wow. All those people I saw. So, I mean, I wanted to talk to him about all of that stuff. And I was such a nerd. It never occurred to me because, you know, guys were not interested in me. So it never occurred to me that he would be. Wow. So the situation I found myself in was, was just, um, I didn't expect it. It was a surprise. <laughs> you were less of a groupie and more of a gropie. A seeker, I guess. He assumed you were a groupie. I guess he did, yeah. You were 17, right? You were, you were young. You were naive. Very. When people realize that, it's like either, ugh, or wow. You know, it's it's not nothing in between. <laughs> Everything kind of unfolded, I guess. Uh, I, I was having a conversation with Ted earlier and um, talking about how one thing just led to another because of this pursuit of the things that interested me. And I had seen Marcel Marceau at Royce Hall, UCLA, and was blown away. I had never seen anybody do comedy without words. So I went backstage and I asked him if there was somebody I could study with in LA and he recommended Richmond Shepard. 
And I was 16 and I was learning mime and improv, which I didn't know I was going to get either. But it was, I really took to it. Without even re consciously realizing that you were preparing yourself for this new creation, Saturday Night Live. Yeah, and the Groundlings, yes. And the Groundlings. But you've always had this problem with auditions. Now, a lot of people have problems with auditions. Yeah, don't we all? And it was almost as if the universe was playing with you because your first ever audition was for Bob Hope. But I want to tell you. Yeah, <laughs> I want to tell you. That blew my mind when I read that. My goodness. Yes, the span of experiences. I mean, it, you would almost think that I've lived in a, you know, longer than I actually have. But uh, <laughs> I think it might have been this guy, Herb Karp, who was an agent at William Morris. And he, he loved the Groundlings. But I had known him when I was a teenager. He worked at Mandel's shoe store in Century City, which is right next to my high school. So I would go with my girlfriend, Sybil, and we would go goof around at the mall, and we'd end up at, at uh, Mandel's, and we would riff with him. And we were so stoked that this, like, adult was hanging out with us and, like, validating our humor and all of this kind of stuff. And then he turns out to be an agent, and I think that he set me up with this audition for Bob Hope. I was in the Groundlings, and I... I did my monologue that I ultimately did in the Godfather group therapy sketch uh, as Sherry the stewardess in the Valley Girl. And this is 1973, you know. And um, as I write in the book, it's like it's, it wasn't even a matter of Bob Hope not getting it. It was a completely different animal of not getting it. You know, he was looking at me like, what are you? What is that thing? <laughs> What's that thing you just did? Because I want to tell you, you and it don't even belong in the same building as show business. <laughs> that's, you know, because I can read minds. So that's definitely what he was. This is a theme going through your book that you can, of course, read people's minds and assume what they're thinking. Mm. And it's not always a positive uh, perspective. It's rarely. Whatever my negative perspective is, everybody else is thinking the same thing. <laughs> because that's how the world works, right? Yeah, sure. You're listening to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show with their special guest, actress, comedian, and original SNL cast member, Lorraine Newman. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Bob Knight, your host on The Date Quiz. And today we have a mom on the show, Hi. Mrs. Marv Mendenhall of Lost Savings, California. Hi, Bob. Hi. What do you do for a living, Mrs. Mendenhall? I'm a mattress trainer at a used wetter bed store. Uh-huh. Okay, here's your first question. What's the best way to chaperone your child? Disguise yourself as a houseplant, dress up as a maid, or tell your child you'll be in your room if they need anything. Well, houseplants are against my religion, so I'd have to say that maid's outfit. Oh. According to our survey, it's best to stay in your room. But my husband, Marv Sr., loves it when I dress up as a maid. Next question. What's the best time to ask your child to be back home? Before 10 or before dawn? Oh, gee, dawn's a bad time because Mr. Mendenhall's a night soil inspector and he's just laying down to sleep around then, so I'd have to say, who in the heck knows? <laughs> oh. According to our statistics, Mrs. Marv, asking your child to be back home by 10 shows you trust him and builds feelings of self-esteem. Well, that's fine, but we usually lock her up in the closet about eight. Oh, well, that's Day Quiz for today. Welcome back to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show, and today we're speaking with Lorraine Newman. Who, Ted, was one of the original members of the Not Ready for Primetime Players when Saturday Night Live began in 1975. Yeah. Before we continue our conversation, Phil, I just wanted to, again, thank the people who are listening and who are contributing to our show's production budget. That's right. We, we've raised enough money now to, to fly down to Cancun. Yes. <laughs> if you're listening to the show and you like what you hear, we've done a bunch of interesting shows with some fascinating people. And you can go to our website, sexyboomershow.com, and see all the shows that we've produced. And you can subscribe on your podcast player right now that you're listening to this on. And if you find it in your heart and would like to help us with our habit, please consider a donation to our show just to help offset our production costs of this noble nonprofit enterprise. Dot, come on, help us. <laughs> Lorraine, so you were in the uh, genesis of, of the Groundlings and SNL. 
Yes. Yeah. Wow. You see, that's amazing. Wow. Times, guys. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Someone wanted to audition for Cal Arts, a friend of mine. So he asked me to be his partner. And I did it with him, and Cal Arts offered me a spot in the theater program. So I thought, why the hell not, you know? I, but I was there for three months. It wasn't for me, but I met Paul Rubens there. And then when I started uh, going into this improv workshop that we eventually formed the Groundlings from, uh-huh. I was on my way to New York to do SNL, and I spoke to Paul, and I said, you got to check this place out. This is for you. Oh, hey, Pee Wee Herman. The music to the comedy to animation, I just feel like I've had a front row seat for all of these things. How did you become part of something that didn't even exist yet, which was, of course, SNL? How did you get involved with that? Well, Lorne Michaels was producing a Lily Tomlin special, and they needed some people for the show. So they came to see the Groundlings, Lorne and Lily. I didn't know they were there, and they hired me from that. And then Lorne was hired to do SNL, and he came back to the Groundlings again. I did not know he was there. And I was doing new characters and new material, and he uh, asked me to meet him at the Chateau Marmont to talk about a show that was a cross between 60 Minutes and Monty Python. Now, Hmm. I really hadn't seen Monty Python. I, I had not heard... I don't know their stuff that well. And he was appalled. It's like, you know, your focus and interest in... In comedy, how could you not know Monty Python? Well, I later learned that Monty Python was not on TV in in California until 1975, by the time I'd already left for SNL. Uh I missed him. But, you know, it sounded, you know, he said Monty Python. Well, that sounds like something funny. You know, so I just said, well, that sounds like something I'd watch. And uh, I said, yes, I want to go. Is that how he described the concept? It was a combination of 60 Minutes and Monty Python? Yeah. Wow. Actually still is. Topical. So you went to New York. Most people go west. You went east. Yeah. I would never have gone to Broadway to try and make it there. I mean, yeah. the idea of going to New York, first of all, I, I wasn't a musical comedy performer at all. I wasn't a singer. So it, it really, even though I knew there was legit theater, I also didn't feel that I was an actor. So I was right at the right place where I needed to be for the things that I wanted to do. And the the idea of going to New York never entered my mind. And I got to say, I was hmm. really bummed when Lauren said, oh, by the way, it's, it's in New York. That scared the shit out of me, oh. you know, because the Groundlings were like a family. They were my support system. And I was so young and inexperienced. And they really bolstered my confidence. And I was going into this situation where I didn't know anybody. And, you know, meeting Chevy and Michael O'Donoghue for the first time, I I was a little nervous. And Lorne had uh, asked me to do a little show for the writers because they really, he was the only, Lorne was the only person who knew what I did. So when I drove cross country to get to New York to do the show, I packed my car with everything, including all my written material and my costumes. And the car was stolen. So, and your record collection your record too, right? Collection, everything, and so. Oh, and a car was stolen in I, New York. <laughs> imagine that. Oh. I hadn't performed any of this material for three months, this whole summer. So I really had to cobble this stuff together, and there was no such thing as facts. You know, you couldn't film your stuff at that point. That would have been a really big deal. I mean, so many groundlings now have films of their work. It's just so much easier, but. You know, there was just nothing for me to go on. And you know how it is. Your material is crafted and honed yes, just the way it needs to be. And I didn't have any of that to work with. It's informed by the people you're working with and the audience. Yeah. So, you know, this little kind of show that I put on for the uh, writers was terrible. And uh, you can read about that in the book. (laughs) When you're talking about writers, you're talking about people like Michael O'Donoghue, legend. And Don Novello. Such nice people, you know. People always talk about it being a boys' club, which, from my perspective, it simply was not. SNL is a meritocracy, and whatever Mm. is funny goes into the show. It doesn't matter who wrote it or whether it's female-centric or what. That's how it was. And there was nobody ganging up on anybody. There were no cliques. It was really very 
egalitarian and people, because we're all like-minded people and we all came from sketch, which is a cooperative form. We just, you know, we were all great with everyone. We're all cool with everyone. And Chevy started as a writer on the show, didn't he? So did Garrett, yes. So did Garrett, mm -hmm. right. Of course, Paul Schaefer, was he um, the, like the musical director? No, Howard Shore was the musical director, yeah, who's gone on to win many Academy Awards for musical scores. Very memorably, uh, I think it was uh, Silence of the Lambs. His, his score on, in that movie is just magnificent. And he took me to see my first David Cronenberg movie. He turned me on to David Cronenberg. I'll always love him for that. <laughs> and you love horror films, right? Always, since I was a little kid. And I know that Ted has shared with you <laughs> the fact that, that he's been a zombie. I know. Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead. Oh, yeah, it was a zombie in Pittsburgh. Mm. Pie throwing scene. In the original. <laughs> I mean, come on. So getting back to those early days of Saturday Night Live where you're writing the rules. I mean, you're just, you're, you're defining what this show was going to be. Mm -hmm. And in the early days, from what I am understood, it was people paired off and wrote bits and it, you know, and they got on. The performers, so much more than when we were on, were, are all expected to write. And that was not the case when we were there. I mean, it just happened to be, Danny was really the only performer in our company that was a writer. Uh, everybody else pretty much uh, just, you know, I mean, I had some of my material from the Groundlings, as I said, that went on the show, but uh, everything else was written by our incredibly wonderful, brilliant writers. And as far as performing is concerned, uh, Bill Murray mm -hmm. was considered for the first season, but there was only one more position open and it went to Chevy. But Bill Murray came, of course, was, was he in, as soon as Chevy left, second season he came on. And I, I mentioned that to you earlier that um, the one time I went to a Saturday Night Live taping, I went to a dress rehearsal, not the actual show. And this guy came out and did the warm up in one of these makeup bibs. And it was Bill Murray. Never had seen him before. Yeah. And he was, wow. you know, he was delightful. And I had seen most of the cast do the National Lampoon show on Bleecker Street. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, in 74 or 5. And I, that's where I first saw Aykroyd and Chevy and Belushi and Gilda. I mean, they were all on. Danny was in that? Are you sure? Uh, no, I'm not sure. See, this is the problem. If you were there, you, you won't Can't remember. remember. I know. Yeah. It's the, uh, I think we dropped acid at that time. So <laughs> I was... Uh, do you keep, have you kept up with Saturday Night Live over, uh, over the years? I love all forms of comedy. I see yeah. everything I can. I love the show. And it's exciting for me because every time a, a groundling becomes part of the cast, I've, you know, I've had a chance to watch these individuals develop. So it's really exciting when they get the show. But, you know, even people like uh, Kate McKinnon and, and Cecily Strong, I mean, these performers are just so formidable, so to speak. You know, um, Mikey Day, who is also a groundling, he's so prolific. I, I, you know, you always know a sketch that he's written. So you're into this first season and you're sort of making it up as you go, literally in terms of creating this show, and it becomes... A happening. It becomes the thing. And then suddenly you're attracting people like Richard Pryor to come and guest host. I revisited a bit that you did with Richard Pryor, Exorcist 2, which was hilarious. Well, I met Richard Pryor when I was 14 huh. because he was friends with my sister and he was performing at the, uh, at the Troubadour guys, the Troubadour. Okay. That's how mm. long ago this was in his career. And so I met him afterwards and so when he was doing the show, I went up to him. I said, I don't know if you remember me. I'm Tracy Newman's little sister. And his face just lit up, you know. <laughs> and I was making homemade soup every day, and I'd bring it in a thermos. And he, you know, asked to taste it, and he loved it. So every day that week, I was making soup for him. And, you know, for me, oh. he's such an idol of mine. And, you know, to be feeding him felt <laughs> so magnificent. You know, like so many of the people that, that you mentioned in your book, I've had this 
strange relationship with meetings with uh, spending time with Jack Nicholson and Richard Pryor was in a, a play that Henry Jaglum had written st- w- with Karen Black and Bonnie Bedelia and Richard Pryor and Charlie Deercup and me called uh, A Safe Place which later became a movie with Tuesday Weld okay and and Richard w- was where this this was in New York at the uh, actors studio writers division Oh, wow. Okay. And and Richard was, you know, because he had some great acting chops. He really did. You know? He's a great actor. And, and yeah, and so uh, he was, that's how I first got to know him. Not so, not as a stand up comic or anything, but as an actor mm. with a great comic sensibility, you know? Yeah. You stayed with Saturday Night Live for five years, and now you're, what, 28? You're still not even 30? Yeah, I'm 28. Yeah. Wow. So then what? Well, it was kind of, um, I was kind of ambling along, as I said many times, no real big picture idea about what I should be doing. And I, I felt, you know, I, I did not think that I did good work on SNL. And I thought that everybody felt the way I did. So, you know, I, I had an agent, but I wasn't really submitted for that many things. So I got involved with looping and it, it's, uh, you know, it should have maybe bothered me that I was doing work off camera for scale, but I just was kind of the, you know, one foot in front of the other kind of person. So I didn't really realize that, you know, you have to have momentum and you have to have heat. Otherwise, you know, you're going to kind of flounder. And even though I continued to do really fun things, they weren't that visible. They were stage things, you know, like the Hollywood primary that was at the uh, Blossom Room at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. That was a political review with Chris Guest and Ed Begley Jr. and Carl Gottlieb. You know, I was doing stuff like that. And then, you know, took classes with my sister at the Groundlings and did a show there. But I was basically kind of floundering, and I was acutely aware of that. And this was also when my drug use really got serious. And I retreated Mm. from the world for a long time. And, um, you know, I found myself at all these A-list parties around people that were so accomplished, and I felt like I didn't belong there. It was just a really, really hard time for me. Um, But you know, I always had this kind of will to live and an optimism despite everything. And um, I finally got to a point where I wanted to get sober, and I did. And um, it took, and it's been 33 years now, which I'm very grateful for. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. But, you know, that's when I started to put my toe out the door. Uh huh. And because I had done that, all these things. I met Chad. We had kids. I started in animation. That inc- that sustained me. And then, you know, I, I actually worked on camera quite a bit. Um, but the animation thing was the thing that stuck. And there were a lot of adventures on the way. You know, I had, before I met Chad, I had some pretty interesting relationships, which you can read about or listen to in the book. Yeah. Yeah, and by the way, there here's another connection. You had a relationship with Mark Mothersbaugh. Yes. Right, of Devo. And he did the music for Rugrats. Okay? And we would and when we first started this, we had a little they had a little studio, Klasky Shupo. Mark was working in like a little closet right next to the little recording booth that we worked in, you know, writing the music for the show on uh, creating it on his synthesizer. Yeah. Such a talented guy and such a funny guy. I absolutely love him. Uh, we're still friends today. I mean, it, he's just the best. Devo was not only an excellent punk band, but they were hilarious. They were very funny. Very funny. We interviewed his partner in Devo, Gerald Casali. We had him on the show, which you can still hear if you'd like. But, you know, getting back to, again, what, what sounded like to me is a self-confidence issue because you, you were on... You were great. I was a big fan. and Yeah, me too. And Saturday Night Live was historic, and you were part of this foundational cast. You know, I mean, some of the things that you did are absolutely so memorable that, that I, I can play them back in my head. And they were inspirational because you, were, you, you seemed so free <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and daring. I just, um, 
you know how it is when you have a certain standard that you want to reach and you don't feel that you did. It's that kind of thing. It's like when I watch the exorcist sketch, it drives me fucking crazy because my little, my, my feet were crossed at the ankles daintily <laughs> while Richard Pryor is throttling me. <laughs> because that's so relaxing. You know, why can't I just, oh, why didn't I just, you know. So it, it's stuff like that. And I know that I'm not unusual. I know most performers go through that. But, you know, I just have my issues with confidence in terms of on-camera work. Um, I'm thoroughly confident in, in animation work. I really feel like I know what I'm doing. But for some reason, on-camera work is, is really tough for me. I watched Exorcist 2 on YouTube last night. It was hilarious. And I have to say, I didn't even look at your feet. I was looking at your makeup on your face when Chevy was doing your voice. And yeah. it was just, you know, it was, didn't even think of it. It's just funny how the perspective is. You yeah. Know? I mean, it's like you're thinking that, but probably no one else is. Yeah, we're much more critical of ourselves than, than the audience is. And then really special scene in your book when a really magical thing happens about your 36th birthday where you were convinced by your friend to throw a birthday party for yourself, mm -hmm. which was something that just wasn't in your wheelhouse and yeah. not knowing what was going to happen. And then I'll just read this because it's really amazing that at four in the afternoon, flower arrangements started to come in from Aykroyd and Donna, his wife, Sam Kinison, and countless others. And then through the door walked Bill Murray, Mitch Glazer, Penny Marshall, John Cleese, Michael Palin, Peter Cook, Sam Kinison, Steve Martin, Jack Nicholson, Angelica Houston, Lorne and Gilda. Bill Murray became the DJ and was spinning your favorite records. <laughs> and at one point in the night, you looked into your living room and you saw everybody just dancing with Angelica's head sticking out because she was so tall. And Michael Palin bending over the honey baked ham with a look of rapture on his face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are absolutely snapshots in my memory. And also at that party, Angelica and my friend Layla Nabulsi and Tom and Lynn Scott gave me a dog. Oh. Which is a really fucking shitty thing to do to somebody. And I, yeah, I know what you mean. Yes. I just, you know, I saw them with the holding a wicker basket with a blanket over that. And all of a sudden, the things that had happened during the week previously, like a murder mystery, like the clues, I played them back in my mind with all the questions that Layla was asking me about dogs. And I, I said, oh, no, you didn't get me a duh. And then <laughs> this little nose poked its way out of the blanket, and it was a miniature dachshund puppy. Oh. And I said, if I had been lactating, my shirt would have been drenched. <laughs> you know? And... Uh, I named him Rye Cooter, and he was my buddy for seven years. <laughs> Rye Cooter. But, yeah, and at one point during the party, I went up to my bedroom, and Steve Mart was there by himself with the dog on his lap, just oh. petting him, and it was so sweet. You know, in another culture, a dog in a picnic basket, uh, would, especially a dachshund, would have, would have become a hot dog. <laughs> Yeah, I, I did talk about that actually at one point in the book because I had to give Rye away. Oh, no. Oh, when you had children, right. Yeah. Um, some dogs adapt. This one didn't. And so, you know, I put an ad in the paper to give him away, and people warned me that there was a certain culture that would eat the dog. And I thought, I am not subscribing to stereotypes. <laughs> I went out way the hell and gone to this woman's house and completely brick backyard. She never looked at him, never picked him up, never pet him, but kept asking me if he was on any medication. Ooh. So I left with him. I did not leave him with her. But he did end up getting adopted by this wonderful woman who renamed him Booger. Oh, how humiliating. <laughs> There's a couple other moments in your book that I were laugh out loud funny. He was frowned upon at SNL to lose it in the middle of a skit, just not to laugh. Right. And you were doing a bit with Rodney Dangerfield. You were parodying Woody Allen's movie Manhattan as Manhasset. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> Rodney Dangerfield says, don't go to Manhasset. I'm telling you, it's rough. I bought a water bit and there was a guy at the bottom of it. <laughs> I have never been challenged in that way. Where I just had, you know, except for the time when Paul Schaefer said fuck on the air. Oh, yeah. 
That was another challenge. The Lady of Aquitaine, it was a takeoff on the Trogs tape. Oh, right. There was this band, the Trogs, that had a hit with Wild Thing. And it was the first of one of those underground tapes where the engineer taped these guys bickering because they didn't have a producer. They were doing it all themselves. And every other fucking word is fucking, you know, like, yeah, yeah, fucking yeah. Daddy, just why don't you play it like you played it be fucking for, you know, all this kind of stuff. So we did it, you know, um, uh, our version, and then we placed it with flogging. And at one point, and, and Danny and John had left the show, but John came back to do the Queen of, uh, the Lady of Aquitaine in drag. He sounded like Hermione Gingold. It was, I never knew he had that in him. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Paul said fucking on the air. And I was in, <laughs> but I had some time to run to the booth and see what was going on. And I, I expected pandemonium. And I opened the door and it was an oil painting. Everybody huh. was just frozen to the console and, and just like, you know, in shock. And then I went back, you know, and, and got into the scene. And then John, he had, a, I think he had a fan or he took a drum mallet cause, that they were using and was punctuating everything she said by whacking Paul with the mallet. <laughs> <laughs> you have to laugh, you know, it's just, I talk a lot about ensemble sketches because I knew, obviously, that people would be interested in SNL. It would be probably the main attraction for a lot of people for the book. Yeah. But the problem is when you're doing the show, you can't see what other, everything else that's going on because you're in a quick change and then you're on stage. So, And I had a talk with uh, Fred Armisen about this and Julio Torres, who was a writer, and he said the same thing. You know, it's just it's really hard to do that. So. I picked out my favorite ensemble sketches and I remember aspects of things that happen behind the scenes relative to those sketches. And I talk about those sketches a lot. Um, and that was really fun for me. They didn't have the technology to have like an eight second delay or something to, to catch those things. They had a five second delay. A five second delay. And they just yeah. didn't have anybody on a mute button ready to go. I think they did. Yeah, they did. In fact, um, what, did he fuck up? <laughs> well, I, you know, uh, did something where I was called on the carpet by the NBC censor, Hermione Otraviasis, where I was doing the Valley Girl, and the expression pissed off is a very common Valley expression at the time. And um, we were told we couldn't say it, you know. And so Lauren said, don't say it in the dress, say it on air. And it's like, you betcha. You know, I was only... <laughs> But when I did, you know, I was told that uh, they, I had to apologize and, and let him know that I had done it deliberately, that it wasn't an accident because that's even more risky. But if I didn't do, if I didn't apologize, the show would um, go on a 10 second delay rather than a five second delay, making it technically not live. Oh. Not Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Was there a lot of pushback at the time? I mean, those were fairly liberal times, relatively speaking. It was always the one that we, we just couldn't get away with. We had Jesus's high school reunion with lines like, Jesus, is that you? Christ, you look good. God, it's good to see you. And no, gone, gone. You couldn't do it. Oh, Wow. I remember you did that skit with Buck Henry, whom I loved when he when he hosted the show. He was babysitting. He was an uncle. And was it you on the glass table that he would get underneath? To, with, did you do that skit? Oh, well, you know. Oh, my God. See? See, it's in my head. I'll never forget that that was it. <laughs> None of us had kids, so we didn't realize how grave the whole idea of a pedophile was. <laughs> Who knew? Well, That's true. Um, and it was kind of Buck's persona of just being all around general, you know, garden variety pervert. We didn't, you know, really get that there was something <laughs> really kind of horrible about him being a pedophile. <laughs> you know, we thought nothing of it. We thought it was funny. And I don't think there was a lot of objection to it either. Again, reflecting the times, I mean, I read about how he hung out at Plato's Retreat, New York's first sex club. God. But, you know, he also co-created Get Smart. Oh, that's right. What a funny, funny man. So funny. Things were wild. Yeah, you? you expected it in a way. You wanted it to happen. It was that kind of, of um, uh, anticipation 
that made Saturday Night Live live mm -hmm. so much, such an event for all of us who love comedy. You know, it was daring. They did a sketch where um, there was a fire at the, like the federal building uh, with the office of people trying to change their names. And they were in being interviewed coming. Did you see that one? Yes. Edith Puffy. My name is Edith Puffy. And I want to change my name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I was dying. The things they get away with now, it's just unbelievable. Well, this has been wonderful. And I, again, I recommend uh, your book highly. It's a storytelling experience, and it's great because Lorraine throws voices in it that are just so good. Yes. It's a story about a time that was really exciting and unique, and if you were a fan of Saturday Night Live or curious about when it started, this is the book to read. It's really fascinating. And fun. May You Live in Interesting Times by Lorraine Newman, available on March 11th. Very refreshing and astonishing and powerful. Thank you so much, guys. This was really fun. Thanks for having me. We love you. Take care. Well, that was absolutely amazing. And the memories that it brought back because of her yes. wonderful memories of the experiences that she's had in her life so far were really inspirational and brave and funny and, and wonderful. Well, Phil, always good to see you. And we'll be back soon with yet another exciting edition of Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. See ya. You've been listening to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show, featuring Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet, and special guest Lorraine Newman. Date Quiz was written and performed by Edie McClurg and Phil Proctor. Music by Eddie Betos and the Nervous Brothers. I'm A. Ernest Guy. Stay tuned for the next episode of Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show, produced by RadioPictures.com, the makers of fine podcasts for seasoned hipsters, man.